Thank you so much, Cameron. Thank you everyone at Steelcase for uh, coming here this afternoon and for um, attending this presentation. So I'm just gonna kick it off to the next slide. So just a little bit about, about me. Um, I have a background in product design from the School of the Art Institute in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Um, with study broad experience at Central St. Martin. Um, as Cameron mentioned, I'm an accessibility specialist at LCM Architects, as well as founder and director of Spork, a Chicago nonprofit for people with uh, disabilities to write and share their lived experience. I also have past experience um, with working at the Institute for Human Center Design and the New England ADA Center. And currently I'm serving on a series of boards um, one is at the Chicago uh, Transit uh, Authority CTA as an ADA Advisory Committee member, as well as chair of the CTA Wayfinding Subcommittee. I'm also an appointed member of Governor Pritzker's Blind Services Planning Council and a fellow and member of Disability Lead, um, as well as a new member to Equip for Equality Protection Advocacy for Individuals with Mental Health. Uh, so we can just kick it off and um, get start and I'm going to show you guys a little snapshot of what we're going to cover today. Um, so we're going to start with uh, the ADA, Disabled Community History, and we're just going to work our way down to uh, how words, tone, inscriptions matter, to how that informs uh, design and disability, and then I'm going to throw a few resources y'all away. So the ADA, and then we can just skip on to the next one. Thank you. And so uh, nothing about us without us, which is uh, a, a motto that uh, is held very dearly by the disabled community and is uh, very fittingly so because this is a political uh, motto that helped establish uh, Poland's 1505 uh, constitutional legislation. And as we go through the history of uh, disability rights, you'll see that uh, when we talk about this uh, phenomenal community, we really can't separate the, um, the political side and the political uh, movements that help uh, get us to where we are today. And so this is just a little snapshot of some of the few um, milestones and accomplishments of the ADA community. Um, and we're gonna just uh, go on to the first one, which is the Fair Housing Act of 1968. So um, the great, the interesting thing about this act, um, it was formed after African American veterans faced housing discrimination, and it was actually not expected to pass. The day of the vote, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, and racial riots actually took place across the country, which pressured uh, then President Lyndon B. Johnson to uh, pressure Congress to pass the new legislation to help ease uh, civil unrest. This is really important because in 1988 is when people with disabilities were included and this uh, the Fair Housing Act has been implemental to the disabled community to getting a fair housing uh, treatment within the United States. And as we go over to Section 504, the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, this amazing act um, would have made hospitals, schools, government buildings, etc. accessible. And it was actually originally vetoed by Nixon due to cost concerns. Um, and this led to mass protests. Um, that uh, also involved veterans from the Vietnam War. The bill, the bill was reluctantly, reluctantly signed into law, but was not enforced until years later. And it really should be pointed out that there is a, a very strong and distinct link between the civil rights movement and then the movement that we're gonna see within the disabled community from the 70s, 80s till now. And we can go into the next slide. So, I have a few of these in here. This is our first, did you know? Did you know that in 1977, Bradley Lumix, a member of the Black Panther Party and a wheelchair user, helped lead the protests uh, called the 504 uh, sit-ins. So like I mentioned before, the 504 was not enforced. Um, so it was on the books, 
was not passed. Um, there were actually a lot of lobbyists who wanted to make changes to the bill because they did not want to make their buildings accessible. Um, and so this, uh, so the 504 Synod came about when Judy Human, who uh, orchestrated uh, the 504 Synod and is called the mother of the ADA, uh, helped when she helped lead these protests. Um, and so they went to the San Francisco Federal Building, uh, took them to task for not implementing the 504 and held a sit-in. And uh, this protest was actually, uh, it lasted a month. And at the time it was the lastest uh, longing protest in United States history. It was said that when the FBI cut the lines to the building, those who were deaf stepped in and kept the communication flowing by signing to those uh, outside. And when the water was shut off, the Black Panthers stepped in and dropped off free hot meals, food, breakfast, and lunch. And in fact, that was eventually followed by union leaders and churches and LGBTQA stores, uh, owned stores, uh, who provided cleaning provisions to the protesters. Uh, so after 26 days, almost a month of being in this building, without any resources, uh, the care worker attendance that people were used to without any of, any of those, these provisions, uh, they, got the, they got the United States government to, uh, to, to eventually implement Section 504 in all federal programs and institutions. And once again, I can't stress how important this sit-in was because it actually helped pave the way for the 1990 Americans with Disabilities Act. And so we go into ADAPT, um, which uh, actually got started in 1973, formerly known as Americans with Disabilities for Accessible Transportation. It was started by 19 young uh, people with disabilities who were incarcerated in nursing homes for most of their lives. And when they moved into their own apartments, they realized that in the community was not built for them. They um, came across a lot of barriers. In 1983, they started one of the many protests, We Will Ride, where they would get out of their wheelchairs and block buses um, to help drive home the fact that there was no policy for public uh, accessible transportation and that in that they were being left out. And then that leads us over to the American with Disabilities Act or the ADA. It was modeled after the Civil Rights Act and the 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. And President uh, George H.W. Bush signed this into law on July 26, 1990. Tomorrow, the ADA will be only 32 years old. And I keep saying this, but it's important to keep in mind that the ADA, um, on top of everything that I've gone over, um, it's, it's all about equal opportunity in law for people with disabilities. Uh, so we can go on to the next slide. So our next, did you know, right before the ADA was passed, uh, there were still a lot of inaccessible uh, uh, discrepancies and discrimination for people with disabilities. And so on March 13th, 1990, 60 demonstrators showed up to the US Capitol building. They cast aside their wheelchairs and other mobility aids and crawled up the Capitol steps. That is 83 stone steps that these people crawled up on their hands and knees to demonstrate and show that the government was inaccessible for them. Go to the next slide, please. In fact, during the Capitol crawl, um, we see this little girl here with the bandana. That is Jennifer Keelan Shafins. She is a wheelchair user from Cerebral Palsy and was one of the youngest demonstrators at the Capitol crawl at only eight years old. She was caught on camera as she was crawling up those 83 stairs as saying, I will take all night if I have to. After the crawl, Jennifer said, I didn't crawl all those steps for me. I did it for all the kids so that life can be better for us as we grow up. Jennifer is now 39 years old. Once again, we're talking about something that happened relatively recently in our 
time frame, the ADA is only 32 years old. <laughs> if we can go into the next slide, please. And so I like to just take a little bit of a step back to look at some of the historical uh, international milestones for people with disabilities. One is in 1982, the WPA, the World Program of Actions Concerning Disabled Persons. The program restructured disability, disability policy into three areas, prevention, rehabilitation, and equalization of opportunities. And then we have the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities the first human rights treaty to be ratified by the European Union, and it was directly inspired by US leadership in recognizing the rights of people with disabilities. This, uh, the convention has been implemental at large to the international disabled community. They have set some amazing principles um, in, for uh, other uh, nations to follow. I'm going to the next one. And so, um, you know, we talk about the history and I think that sometimes people um, forget just how large the disabled community actually is. According to the World Health Organization, the disabled community is the world's largest minority group. One billion people or one in seven people on earth has a disability. Next slide, please. And in fact, when we break that down a little bit more, 80% of disabilities are acquired uh, between the ages of 18 and 64. 80% of those disabilities, uh, of those with disabilities live in developing countries. In eight years, uh, is the average of uh, how long uh, someone, I'm sorry, eight years. Uh, so an individual um, will spend on average about eight years of living with uh, a disability. And, uh, and that's for everybody over the age of 70. Uh, it is uh, statistically guaranteed that you are going to spend about 11.5% of your life once you pass the age of 70 um, living with a disability. And it should also be noted that women with disabilities um, in most countries um, have uh, double discrimination and concerns um, just for the simple fact that they are a woman with a disability. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and then when we take it on home to the United States, 26% or one in four of adults in the United States have some sort of disability. And the American South is actually where the highest percentage of people with disabilities live. And fun fact, um, depression is actually the number one most common disability in the US. Um, so once again, when we're looking at disability from a micro and macro level, this is something that uh, is very common and prevalent and, uh, and should be kept in mind um, as we just look at human rights and just general issues. The, these, the topics or the concerns of people of, uh, of the disabled community uh, is one that um, it hits home and it will hit home. Uh, so next slide, please. So our next, did you know? Did you know that it used to be illegal to be disabled in public? Yeah, it's true. It was uh, enacted and actively enforced between the American Civil War, 1867, and World War I, 1918. Ugly laws were put on the books to outlaw the appearance of those who were diseased, maimed, mutilated, or any way deformed so as to be an unsightly or disgusting object. This is a direct excerpt, by the way, from the Chicago Code of 1881. Next slide, thank you. Um, and Chicago was actually the last city to repel its ugly laws. And that didn't happen until 1974. So from all this time, ugly laws were on the books and it was really as a way to discriminate and dissuade people um, with visible disabilities to be outdoors and present. Um, so when we look at these laws and when we look at where, where the disabled uh, community has come from and is coming from, uh, it's really, really important to, to remember that we live in a history 
where being disabled, being uh, having a visible disability was enough excuse for you to be fined. And so when we look at the progress that we've made now, it really is coming from a, a place of a great concern and discrimination. And you know, it's, it's important to also note that since 2000, there have been 181 countries that have passed disability civil rights laws that once again have been directly inspired by the ADA. And this is according to the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund. So as you can see, um, a lot of the laws that were put that have been put on the books and a lot of uh, continents and countries um, have been put on the books fairly recently. And in fact, if you look at South Africa, the code of good practice, there is no separate disability legislation. So that is the only code um, of, of protection of guidance for people with disabilities, which is uh, the key aspects of employment um, for people. And when you look at uh, the continent by how many people with disabilities actually live within the continent, once again, we're not talking about a small number and we're not talking about um, a minority minority in any sense. You know, We're talking about millions upon millions of people who have a disability, who, uh, who are living within the world, um, and some of the places that they live actually don't have strong enough legislation on them to, uh, to guarantee them rights. And it should also be noted that only 26% of the 193 constitutions explicitly guarantee the right to health to people with disabilities. So a lot has been accomplished, but there is still a lot that needs to be done. Next slide, please. Which leads us to current community concerns or what I like to call the duality of being disabled, the cause and effect. So we're just gonna look at um, just a few of those concerns, uh, safety, healthcare, education, and employment. So for instance, safety in some countries up to a quarter of disabilities result from injuries and violence, which also means that people with disabilities are four times more likely to experience violence. A quarter of all people with disabilities cannot afford health care, and those who are within the system are four times more likely to be treated badly. And then we look at uh, education, 90% of children with disabilities in developing countries do not attend school. And the global literacy rate for adults with disability is as low as 3%. And then lastly, employment, 386 million of the world's working age people have a disability. But employment among people with disability is as high as 80% in some countries. And so, you know, as there's a lot of reasons for these discrepancies, and we're going to um, actually slide on to the, the one of the reasons, which is attitude, no terminology. Words, tone, and descriptions matter. And I'm sorry. Oh, thank you. Um, and so uh, the next quote uh, is one of my favorite quotes. It comes from Tom Harkin, the author of the ADA and uh, its chief sponsor in the Senate. He said, as I often said in the past, the biggest barriers for people with disabilities are not the physical barriers they have, but the attitudinal barriers. And it should be um, kept in mind that uh, Mr. Hawkins, um, he does not have a disability himself. Actually, he has a brother who is deaf. And when Harkin delivered part of his introduction speech, it was in sign language, saying it was so his brother could understand. So this is a really good example of someone using their position of power to help others with disabilities although they themselves are not disabled. We're gonna to go to the next slide, please. Thank you, oh, I'm sorry, is that the next slide? Oh, thank you. Um, and so this leads us to the World Health Organization and how they define disability. They say that disability, in a nutshell, occurs in this interaction between a person and their functional ability and the environment. And so a few examples of what those barriers look like can kind of be broken down between these. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, they can be broken down between attitudinal, 
which is behaviors, perceptions, and assumptions that discriminate against people um, with disabilities. Communication occurs when sensory disabilities have not been considered. Physical, structural obstacles in natural or man-made environments that prevent or block mobility or access. Policy, frequently related to a lack of awareness or enforcement of existing laws um, to make activities accessible for people with disabilities. And then lastly, technology occurs when a device or technology or a technology uh, technological platform is not accessible. And uh, what we're going to focus on during this section is actually attitudinal. And I think it's really important to, you know, uh, when th this, this quote always comes to mind whenever I go into this part of attitudinal is from Freud. Uh, it's uh, words have a magical power. They can bring either the greatest happiness or deepest despair. And as we go through the next few slides, you're going to understand why that is so true. Next slide, please. Thank you. Oops. So the first antiquated term that we're going to start off with is cripple. So I want to say that many people with disabilities are, in fact, actually seeking to reclaim this word as their own. Um, this is one of those words that is seen as an identifier and a unifier, identifies a person to their group, and people feel that it also unites them to that group. Um, and there are, I'm, I'm not sure if for some of you might remember the hashtag crip vote that was going around um, during the last election, but this is one of those words that is trying to be uh, reclaimed. This does not mean in, in any ways that anyone outside of the disabled community uh, has the right to use this word, um, especially in reference to someone else who is disabled. This is a generational term uh, terminology. People who uh, were born during the time where uh, cripple was a very prominent and, and, and use word to describe someone who's disabled, you know, if they themselves have a disability, it, it's fine for people to call themselves and identify themselves how they feel comfortable. Once again, though, if you do not have a disability, especially in a work in, uh, environment, cripple is um, really considered uh, antiquated and an old term uh, use. Instead, if you're trying to grasp for a word to use outside of cripple, I would just say use uh, disability. Um, next, thank you. Uh, the next word is uh, deaf and dumb. Um, I'm pretty sure that most of us have heard of this. Uh, did you know that this is actually coined uh, in 355 BC by Greek philosopher Aristotle? He linked intelligence with hearing. And as you can see on the slide, um, he was quoted as saying, a person's destitute from birth of either sense, the blind are more intelligent than the deaf and the dumb. This is the power and destruction of words because as we know, this is a term that is still used today. People drop it um, you know, in conversation more often than I would ever like to hear. And, uh, and it's completely an incorrect statement. It's an incorrect term. If you are trying to figure out what to use besides deaf and dumb, please just say deaf, non-speaking or non-verbal please strike deaf and dumb from your vocabulary. Next is handicap. So um, I do wanna say, as you probably saw with cripple, I'm putting up here uh, the verb in the adjective, um, which these come directly from Merriam-Webster dictionary. These are their definitions. And it's really important to keep in mind uh, the verb and how it's used when it's talking about an object and then how it's used when it's talking uh, about a person and how it's applied. And, and that is, I think the, the big thing to remember about you know, when we say words have power, they really do. The, the definition and description often put people within a box. So I want to say about the word handicap, uh, it's uh, in late 19th century, um, the term affliction began to disappear and people started to use the term handicap. And, you know, afflicted used to mean grievously affected 
affected or troubled by a disease. So, you know, in comparison, handicap was considered a, a step up in terms of a humanizing term. Um, and the popular origin story um, that people often associate with handicap is that during uh, England, uh, during King Henry VII's reign, uh, the soldiers who were unable to make a living for themselves after the war were forced to go on the streets and beg with a cap in their hand, begging for coins. Actually, the, the background of the word is not that exciting. It's a late 19th century uh, a word that comes from a game called Hand in a Cap. It's a game of chance. Um, if you are grappling again to figure out another word to use besides handicap, use accessible, disabled. So instead of uh, handicap parking spaces, accessible parking spaces, et cetera, uh, it's a little bit more, um, uh, it's a better word to use. Uh, next slide, please. And then, of course, we're going to go into wheelchair bound um, or confined to a wheelchair. I just want to say to everybody, wheelchair users aren't bound to their chair. It's simply a device that gets them from point A to point B. Um, you, to overly use such words as wheelchair bound, et cetera, just really uh, perpetuates a negative stereotype. And instead of wheelchair bound, I you know, implore you to use wheelchair user instead. Um, it's, it's one of the better words to use. And then the last, oops, and then the last word, the R word. So this is one of the worst words that you could possibly use within the disabled community. It's incredibly offensive. I do want to say a little bit about the background of the word. It was introduced as a neutral term by the American Association on Mental Retardation in 1961, and it was actually adopted by the American uh, Psychiatric Association into their DSM, their Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders. Over time, the R word came to be used as an insult. I know most of us have probably heard it used as mainly an insult and it's been tossed around as a synonym for stupid, dumb, idiot. And it's actually now considered a slur and hate speech. This, if out of all the words that we go over when, you know, antiquated words that we've gone over, please strike this from your vocabulary. Um, in modern times, there's no real place for this word, especially when you're talking about somebody who might have the middle mental or intellectual disability. Um, so uh, it's just keep that in mind. Uh, next slide, please. And so, uh, which kind of brings us into what new words can we bring into the conversation, right? We went over the history of, of people within the disabled community and now we've gone over words that are really antiquated and generational and need to be taken out. Um, you know, the good news is that there's kind of a, a nice set of words that we can use to help describe people with disabilities. And actually one term that I think is incredibly important is functional limitation. Functional limitations can lead to a disability. Um, and an example of this is, you know, at times, I wear glasses to help me see. I'm not wearing them now. I wear glasses, which is considered a functional limitation because I cannot uh, operate the same way with my eyes as intended. Um, and as my eyesight gets worse, and if I lose vision, I will have a disability. Functional limitations lead to a disability, and it's really important to keep that in mind. Most of us are living within a range of functional limitations to, um, and even though we might not have a diagnosis of a disability, it's really important to, to keep in mind that there is a, a close relationship between uh, how we're functioning and how it might uh, uh, progress. And then um, keep in mind that when we talk about disabled, first, there's nothing wrong with the word disabled. I wanna clarify that. There's nothing wrong with the word disabled or being disabled. In fact, I am somebody who probably identifies as uh, someone with a non-apparent disability. You know, uh, being disability, uh, having a disability is a fact of life and it's very natural. 
but it really needs to be kept in mind that stigmas still exist around the word disable. And as you see from the verb and adjective, it's kind of easy to see why. Um, and you know, it's interesting because shying away from the word disable as an identifier and a unifier um, can create more societal stigma but people really do have a drastic varying relationship with the word, you know, depending on the person's origin of country, their locale, adopting that word disable as an identifier can lead to discrimination. Um, and ultimately, you know, at the end of the day, it's really up to the individual uh, with the disability, the diagnosis, the functional limitation to define how they relate to the word. And uh, I think that that is incredibly, incredibly important um, to keep in mind, especially the fact that um, this is why uh, euphemism, euphemisms tend to come up and tend to get adopted. People might feel uncomfortable with one word, but they feel a little bit more comfortable with another word with how it describes their situation. Um, as you talk to people with different lived experiences and different disabilities, it's just really important to kind of keep that in the back of your mind when you're talking to them, um, especially if they're not open about disclosing their disability, et cetera. So we're going to go to our next, did you know? So according to a disability history of the United States by Kim Nielsen, uh, in indigenous cultures, disability occurred when someone lacked or had weak community relationships. The example that they use was a young person, a young man with cognitive impairments might be an excellent water carrier. That is his gift. If the community required water and if he provided it well, he lived as a valued community member with no stigma. Although his limitations shaped his contributions, the same was true for everyone else in the community as well. Uh, next slide, please. And it really has been said that um, it was when after the Europeans arrived in North America and created institutions for people in, for uh, disabilities, the reluctance of uh, handing over family members to this outside care has been attributed to the relational definition of disability. So once again, when we talk about disabled, especially when we break down what the word means um, and how, it, how we apply it to others, we really need to understand that that, that, uh, that is not a standard for all cultures and for all communities. Um, and, and I think it's a perfect example. And so, which leads us into the etiquette do's and don'ts. So person first language is where the person comes before the descriptor. And this is very important, especially when we're talking about people with disabilities. You don't say the disabled, it's person with a disability, right? There, um, we went over deaf and dumb and mute. No, it's person who is deaf, et cetera. This type of language emphasizes the person first, not their disability. And this, disabilities can be seen as part of someone's identity, but keep in mind that it's not their entire disability. So avoid the generalizations and you know, really practice person first language. It's incredibly respectful. And if someone wants to be addressed in a different way, believe me, they, they will let you know. <laughs> Next slide, please. And so this leads us to disability types. And so um, generally it is seen that it can get broken down between physical, cognitive, and non-apparent. And as you see, here are some examples, a uh, few examples at that of what um, disabilities and disorders uh, fall under which category of disability type. Um, keep in mind that cognitive disabilities are conditions that create difficulty uh, concentrating, remembering, or making decisions, while non-apparent disabilities include psychiatric disabilities, chronic pain, chronic fatigue, mental illness. Um, and fun fact, about 10% of Americans have a medical condition which could be considered a non-apparent disability. And so, um, next slide, please. And so when we bring in that word functional limitation again, which keep in mind, functional limitation can lead to a disability. This is how um, functional limitation tends to get broken down with the types, physical, brain-based, 
sensory. I want to really keep in mind that uh, one of the terms that gets overused quite a bit, especially when it comes to brain-based disabilities and functional limitations, is the word neurodivergent or neurotypical. Um, uh, it's important to understand that by definition, it is not a disability, how um, the definition of it, but it's really a difference in how the brain works. And the word neurotypical more often is used to describe um, people who are autistic or people with autism, but it's a misleading umbrella term that really gets used for learning developmental um, disabilities and mental health. Um, and some organizations and, and, and most people have a, an issue with the word um, because it's been now used as an alternative to the word normal. Um, and it does not describe a type of brain in any biological sense. And so, um, you know, a person cannot be neurodiverse. It really is about a group. And so it's just really important to keep in mind that when we're talking about labels, right, and how um, we're defining others and, and defining ourselves, um, that we understand some of the nuances and, and the labels that we use and why others might be uh, reluctant to, to, um, to have those labels adhere to them. Uh, next slide, please. And then it should also be remembered that um, there's health transitions, right? Um, as we grow uh, and get older, there are a, a number of ways that we can um, experience a disability, either as congenital, acquired, temporary, permanent. And, you know, really keep in mind that 80% of disabilities are acquired. Uh, acquire between the ages of 18 and 64. And again, about eight years of our lives, um, if we live 70 and over, it's gonna be spent with a disability. So understanding how that relates to us is incredibly important. Um, and that also keep in mind that more than 46% of people aged 60 and over have disabilities. So we're talking about aging population as well. More than 250 million older people experience moderate to severe disability. This is all to say disability is a very natural part of life. It is, is very natural in the occurrence of, of our transition in life. And it's really, again, important to understand how we relate with our lived experience to disability as a whole. So a few tips. Um, Speak directly to a person with a disability, uh, not to their companion or sign language interpreter. I see this happen uh, quite a lot. And I know that people tend to be um, very well-meaning, but please speak directly to the person who has disability. Um, and adults are uh, with disabilities are adults. Uh, I, again, something I unfortunately see quite a bit. Um, I see people people tend to tone down or baby down how they talk um, when talking to somebody who might have uh, a mental health or, or cognitive uh, disability. Unless you know the person and you know that that's how they prefer talking to, please um, don't make it a habit to, to kind of baby your talk um, when you're talking to people with disabilities. Um, and then also please keep in mind that people who have psychiatric disabilities, um, um, have different ways of coping with their disability. Um, so just a, a lot of times we see someone act out in a way that we think is atypical and then we judge them or, um, you know, and that's how assumptions and discrimination, you know, just can start. If you see somebody who's acting what you think is a little bit, you know, what you might consider different or whatever, just please keep in mind that that might be their way of coping with whatever they're um, dealing with at the time. And then lastly, if you're unsure of how you should interact with a person with a disability, just ask them. Most people um, actually are, are very happy to be asked directly about how um, uh, uh, interaction can be improved or, you know, it it's really is one of those best practices. We'll tell you if there's something wrong, um, but please ask us and we'll tell you. Um, and then this goes into disability and design, inclusive, universal, thoughtful design. And so this is um, from Judy Human, remember the mother of the ADA. Part of the problem is that we tend to think that equality is about treating everyone the same when it's not. It's about fairness, it's about equity of access. 
which leads us into the principles of universal design. So these seven principles of universal design were developed in 1997 by architect, product designers, engineers, and environmental design researchers um, led by the late and great Ronald Mace. Using these principles of universal design can really help better understand how good thoughtful design can affect us all. And so we're just going to go through uh, the seven principles real fast. Oops, go back one. There we go. Uh, so the first one is equitable use, usable by people of diverse abilities. So the example that we see here in the picture are power doors with sensors. If you are a person in a wheelchair, use mobile mobility device. If you have a cart full of groceries, or if you are a mother with a big uh, pram with bunch of kids in it. Power doors are an amazing function that creates equitable use for all. The next one is flexibility in use. So it accommodates a wide range of individual preferences and, ability, and abilities. And so the example that we have here are large grip scissors used to accommodate um, so that you can use them with either hand uh, going in either direction. It helps with repetitive tasks. It does not uh, discriminate against how you actually use the item. It is still functional and perfectly fine um, no matter how you adopt it to your use. Next one is simple and intuitive use, easy to understand regardless of the user's experience, knowledge, skills, or current concentration level. I'm sure most of us have seen these along campuses or hospitals, those large um, emergency call buttons. They're usually signified by a plain color and the button is usually signified by red or yellow. It's easy to use if you don't speak the, if you don't speak the language um, where the box is being presented in, you can typically put two and two together about the use of how you need to access it. Simple and intuitive, everyone can use it. Next is perceptible uh, information, easy to understand regardless of the user's experience, knowledge, uh, language skills, or current concentration level. Uh, so I'm sure some of us may not have these phones still, but if you do, it's a great Great phone, I actually really like these. Uh, so those uh, smaller flip phones where there's the bumps on the lettering, um, people who are visually impaired, uh, typically um, before uh, smartphones became really popular with their built-in um, accessibility um, uh, uh, preferences, these smaller flip phones with the dots made it easy for someone who was visually impaired to uh, locate the buttons um, and keep track of the number that they're calling. Perceptible information, very easy to use. Tolerance for error minimizes hazards and the adverse consequences of accidental or unintended actions. This is actually one of my favorite principles um, because I love the idea of when the tolerance for error is built in in products. The example that we have here in the picture is uh, one of those uh, trip trigger nail guns. Uh, you have to activate the safety before you can actually uh, pull the trigger and nail the gun. Once again, I love products that do this because because it takes out um, the, the, the risk of injury if you mess up. And tolerance of error, human error, should always be um, built in when we're looking at designs. Next one is low physical effort can be used efficiently and comfortably and with a minimum of fatigue. And so the great thing that about this principle of design is that it actually incorporates part of the ADA. And the ADA says that operable parts can't, um, uh, shouldn't require twisting or pinching or turning of the wrist. Low physical effort takes that into mind and it brings into uh, a bit more of a design understanding of what that looks like. And so the example we have here is a door lever that can you can use with a closed fist, um, which is much easier to use than the uh, typical door handles that we see that are round that you need to grip and turn. And then the last one is size and space um, for approach and use. Appropriate size and space is provided for approach, reach, manipulation, and use regardless of user's body size, uh, posture, or mobility. Once again, this sneaks in some of those great ADA uh, requirements about uh, maneuvering clearances and approach, and it really applies it um, across the board of how you can uh, use it when 
in this example, approaching a subway uh, gate when you have to leave. Um, so uh, wonderful, wonderful principle. And so did you know that about 19.9 million people have difficulty lifting and grasping? So this is not people with disability. This is people as a whole. 19.9 million people as a whole have a difficult lifting and grasping. These are, by the way, 2012 statistics from, I believe, from the WHO. So that number has gone up. So when we think about this, um, people who might have issues with, with grasping a glass or a pen, when we think about the principles of design, we're really thinking about low physical effort, right? And then the flexibility in use. And then next slide, please. And then just kind of break it down a little bit more, right? When it comes to physical, 18% of adults have serious difficulty walking or climbing stairs. And so if we're thinking about uh, remembering that functional limitations can lead to a disability, and then if we're thinking about the seven principles of universal design, you know, um, some people who have physical concerns like this can really benefit from, can really benefit from the principles of equitable use, size, and space for approach and use. Same with brain base. Those who have difficulty concentrating, remembering, or making decisions really benefit from the principles of design that go around simple and intuitive use and tolerance for error. And then we have a uh, sensory um, of difficulty hearing and seeing, which once again, as we talked about before, perceptible information from the universal design helps kind of bring that to head of how all seven principles work within functional limitations, work within the statistic of uh, human limitations and still provide a uh, design that is uh, accessible and equitable. So, including the disabled community. So we talked about the community, we talked about the language that uh, needs to be struck from, from our conversation. We talked about universal design. And so now everybody wants to include people with disabilities into your next project. So this is where you start, right? First, hire consultants and disability-based, um, I'm sorry, hire consultants and then create disability-based advisory boards uh, and ensure that in this process, that state and national ADA and accessibility codes are being followed. Let me tell you, um, it is so much easier to have, um, to have uh, to incorporate people with disabilities and ADA code at the very beginning than it is later on. Secondly, uh, get people involved on the user testing side, invest in paid surveys and, and focus groups of people with disabilities. And then third, involve users with disabilities when retesting products, make adjustment as needed. Most people bring in people with disabilities in the third step, and by then it's usually too late. You already put the product through, uh, you already figured out what the product is gonna be. It might already be going through production. And if there are any major changes, it's typically too late to make. So once again, include people with disabilities at the very beginning. And some of the benefits, let me tell you, there are quite a lot of benefits of including people with disabilities in this process. So the first one is you're acquiring data based on lived experience versus assumed experience. Anybody can sit in a wheelchair for an afternoon and say, this must be how someone in a wheelchair operates. That is gonna be a very false and limited uh, snapshot of that uh, ability and what that person has to go through. It's also important to keep in mind that as we've gone through ability, disability comes in all shapes and sizes. A manual wheelchair user um, uses their device very differently than an automatic wheelchair user. And someone who uses a cane uh, experiences their environment some, um, very differently than someone with a guide dog. So bring in those lived experiences. That direct observational data really will help support your design development. And then the other wonderful thing is that you get an educational experience of working with and designing for people with a range of abilities. You're not pigeonholing yourself to one demographic. You're really opening up the board to uh, uh, so many uh, paying demographics um, in terms of your design. And then lastly, you're creating a shared investment between the community and the company and the product. 
the disabled community is very loyal towards companies and institutions that actively include them in the process and product. So if you show at the beginning that you have a sincere approach to include them in the community, then, uh, then you will have a level of loyalty that um, is, will just help branding and everything. And then takes us to tips. Our next slide. Oops. Um, always pay product reviewers and focus group participants. Always, 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 always. Um, the reason why is that you actually have better control of uh, the quality of your data because you're paying for it. You're able to ask those direct um, questions and you're able to um, to really get that observational side that that you're um, that you might miss out if you're asking people to just give you information for free. Um, every place I worked at where we paid participants versus where we didn't, um, there's been a great uh, decline in quality with the information that we ultimately get. And then when needed, in addition to a flat include travel expenses and personal care assistance fee. This is really important because uh, if you do have a disability, um, traveling can still be um, a bear sometimes. Uh, there are different services outside of public transportation like PACE that gets used that you have to pay for. Um, and so if you're asking someone to travel to you, make sure that you're copying them for that. And then especially if that person typically uses a personal care assistant, um, it's really good practice to pay that person, that personal care assistant, about maybe 25% of what you were paying uh, the individual. Once again, you want that person to be comfortable in the environment and give you the best information as needed. Um, paying them and making sure that they can cover those expenses really will help you with the quality of data that you get at the end of it. And then lastly, ensure that your pool of participants are representative of the community at large. I'm talking about diverse and ability range, race, age, and really, if needed, by locale. Having somebody that lives in the suburbs versus um, in the middle of a city is you're going to get a um, different level degree of data of information, same as like I mentioned before, someone is an automatic wheelchair user versus manual wheelchair user. And then the last part we can um, is resources. And so I'm just going to quickly go through a few resources that are um, worth noting. So first is Spork, my nonprofit. Uh, we've been around since uh, 2013, and we have uh, uh, featured a combination of 160 original written pieces of work and video interviews by over 50 writers and creatives within a disabled community. We're really taking to heart the spirit of the Discrimination Diaries that came out in 1988, which was a national campaign where people with disabilities documented their daily lived experiences. So we're trying to keep that uh, tradition alive in our uh, virtual platform, uh, sporkability.org. And then a few other great resources that I highly, highly, highly recommend is, uh, oops, next slide, please. Uh, is uh, A Disability History of the United States by Kim E. Nelson. Um, fabulous book, please pick up, Universal Design and Mythology Approach, um, all the way to the top. Uh, this is a wonderful children's book, if you have any kids. This is a wonderful children's book that covers the ADA and actually talks about uh, Jennifer, the, the little girl at the beginning of the Capitol Crawl. It goes about her story. And then, of course, if you have not seen Crip Camp, which is a phenomenal documentary that's on Netflix, Netflix won quite a few awards. Please watch it, especially before tomorrow's ADA Day. And then we have wonderful organizations like uh, the ADA uh, National Network um, and volunteer opportunities. The reason I put volunteer opportunities is working with people with disabilities is truly a highlight and, and one of my personal proudest uh, moments is when I get to be able to be involved with people who are not, who function in a different way than me. Um, be able to get some of that experience, you can get through volunteering. So you can go to volunteermatch.org, find different uh, nonprofits in your areas that assist um, those with disabilities, and please um, see who you can assist. And a few of our references, that um, statistics that were used throughout today. And that is it. Thank you, everybody. Um, if I know we went over quite a bit today, 
but um, oops, I'm sorry, I can't go to the last slide. I know we went over quite a bit today, um, but if during the Q&A, if you have any questions that come to mind, uh, please feel free to email me at whitney at sporkability.org. Uh, 